Uh, welcome to the KCP community meeting, July 13th, 2021. Uh, since last week, there have been a number of PRs that were sent out and some merged. Um, one of them was, I know we talked about, I think it was two weeks ago or perhaps three weeks ago, um, that all of the type negotiation stuff that David has been working on, oh, David, oh, great. Uh, all the type negotiation stuff that David's been working on is, uh, separately potentially useful outside of KCP just as a sanity check on whether, you know, the change you are proposing to a, to a CRD type is good, is one that's going to cause problems. So, um, with that in mind, I basically split out a little uh, package main binary that calls the compat code and tells you whether the change you're proposing making is is valid or not. Um, and with an LCD flag that will emit the LCD if you uh, if you want that. So one of the use cases is you can before applying it, you can say here is what the the cluster's current food uh, CRD is. And here's my proposed new foo CRD, and it will tell you, you know, you're making a, a bad change or whatever. Um, there's not much to that. It's basically just wrapping David's code in a, a package main. Um, another one to create. Right now, we have a create kind clusters uh, script that creates two clusters, east and west. And in order to demo rebalancing across clusters, I wanted to have it more easily, you know, be able to create five clusters or create three clusters or whatever. So uh, that's a small refactor for that. Um, uh, going through some of the stuff last week around uh, linting and, and uh, stuff, a lot of lint checks came up with bugs or, or, or sorry, coverage. Uh, we added a lot of coverage checks and schema compat is currently sitting at like 30% coverage. Um, so if you are interested in, in increasing the, the the coverage for this, this is a good sort of, uh, I won't call it mindless, because it's mostly uh, find out where we don't have coverage and come up with a test case that will cover that. Uh, do that you know, 10 or 20 times and increase the coverage 400% uh, in the process. I guess not 400%. Uh, increase it a bunch in the process. Um, uh, that's sort of a, a good thing to do if you have spare cycles and are interested in it. It's it's mainly mechanical work to identify a case, find a case that will cover it and contribute it. Um, uh, Joaquim had a, a, a great, um, I haven't actually played with it yet, but but a, a prototype of KCP ingress for multi-cluster ingress. I don't know if you want to talk about that anymore um, or any, any details or... or um, Okay, well, uh, basically, I took the deployment splitter that you did and adapted to to work with with ingresses. Right now, I'm trying to make a full, you know, the, the full demo. Just deploy, well, deploy a deployment, deploy a service, deploy an ingress, you know, everything, and just drive some traffic through it. There are some complications as this is a local setup. And as you know, for example, in Mac, in Mac OS, you get this virtual machine. In Linux, it changes a little bit. So I'm trying to, to do it as, as the simple way I can, honestly. And well, I have, you know, working on that, uh, there are a lot of questions that, that arise perhaps. And if you want, talk about them or just to put them in a document or whatever you want. I mean, we can we can talk about them here. We can talk about that if you want to um, uh, well, link to issues or link to a place where you're where you're collecting these notes. I think it would be useful um, to sort of okay. if there are issues that are coming up because of the specific issues of ingress, that's helpful. And if there are issues that are coming up because of how KCP is working or not working or or working unusually. That would be helpful to be able to like identify uh, things we can improve upon. You no, know, it's it's stuff like, um, for example. So who who is making the decision to actually replicate an ingress to which physical clusters? You know who will make that decision? For example, right now this is basically just listing all the cluster and deploying it there there can be like an an optimization which is i will send only the ingress 
to the clusters that have certain service that's pointed by the ingress itself, you know, just to, mm -hmm. so we are moving the decision one level up to the ingress sinker or splitter or whatever, you know, this is the kind of, of questions that I have right now. Um, and then there is a lot, something that I, I think we should put in a, in a document or some issues to discuss, which is um, translation of different ingress types to another one and standardization of the ingress controllers in one side, you know, stuff like that. But hmm. yeah. Some issues I find w with the controller, which sometimes it's like um, we are skipping some events, which is not actually possible, but uh, I think the things are not syncing back or there is something weird. I don't know if it's my changes or, but I will try to debug that and, and find what's going on. Yeah, there, there was uh, maybe, sorry, just a word on that. Um, there was a, a, a pending bug uh, on the Kubernetes uh, feature branch um, that, that could lead to, yes, some, Events not being taken in account because the cluster name is not correctly set on on the you know the object retrieved by the lister the client lister. Uh, this has been fixed. So uh, in the very last uh, pull request that has been merged, I think this morning on the Kubernetes um, feature branch, and and there is a pending pull request I created to update the commit on the KCP side. So I mean probably this could help. On the other hand, it seems that there are some other uh, possible causes of such, you know, uh, problems as you mentioned. Uh, even even after this fix, um, typically I when when trying to run the the KubeCon demo as as an integration test, uh, if I do it locally, everything works correctly. If I do it uh, when it's it's run, you know, on on GitHub as a GitHub action, it seems that the um, split deployment are not synced back. Uh, so for now, I don't know what's what's the point, but it might be related to you know conflicts that we have when we update the status because, as you know, uh, uh, you, you you if an object is is you know if there is some sort of concurrency, then you might end up with a conflict and you have to retry and possibly retry with back off and it's not something that we handle you know very cleanly or very systematically. So uh, there might be still some other corner cases where uh, synced sync or splitting is not it's not always fully correct so we we have to hit that and every use case that you you might have uh, where um, uh, that would lead us to such a situation would be very interesting to to track precisely those corner cases yeah right. yeah sounds like it uh, david yeah thank you and so if, about sorry. So if you could open an issue, even 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 for that, that uh, you know, with with your um, scenario, it's hard to to reproduce. Honestly, <laughs> it's sure. you know, it's sometimes uh, rebuilding the environment works perfectly. You know, it's it's this type of bugs that. But yes, sure. I will check and and try to open an issue with some example scenario that that is happening. yeah exactly and then we can try to to reproduce but at least it, it gives us an, an idea of the type of you know race conditions or or subtle yeah. subtle bugs that, that also appear. github actions uh, i had a lot of issues with that mostly when deploying kubernetes clusters and things like that into github actions it's really resource constrained sometimes and Yes, yeah, so yeah. that yeah that that might be it, and that might be the difference between my laptop. I I assume I assumed, and and GitHub Actions is that you know, probably things do do, do not follow the exact same flow, and finally there are some conflicts, and and we 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 hit some sort of race condition that we did not think of uh, when deploying locally. That might be something like that, but but for now I don't have more more information. I mean more insights. So the known thing. Sorry. Yeah, the the to be clear that the things taking up resources in this scenario are likely mostly the actual kind clusters that we run in that end-to-end -end test, right? The the KCP binary itself, the controllers that we're writing, the sinkers are pretty slim as far as resource requirements go, but then running two Kubernetes 
uh, API servers alongside it blow up the resources. So yeah, maybe there is an area of of uh, investigation as well, which would be um, the CPU uh, requirements for KCP. I mean, in terms of memory, I'm not sure. You know, that's that's very. But but even when I run that locally, it seems that KCP is still you know. Uh, at least when you run the the overall um kcp that contains also the cluster manager um it seems that it it somehow uh, consume you know let's say 10 or 13 percent of the cpu by well, something mm. that is just not nothing that is still, right so it, even when you when we have a yeah, I, i've have seen it. that well. yeah because we have uh, quite powerful machines but I assume that those yeah. 13 persons on our machines would mean quite much on, on GitHub Actions. Yeah, we get we get the question uh, fairly regularly. What kind of resource requirements are we are we targeting, or, or, or do we currently incur? Um, and having a better answer, having an experientially based answer for that would be nice, as opposed to not so much, not so bad. Uh, <laughs> and I'm sure there are. Uh, I'm sure in our in our Frankensteining apart the Kubernetes uh, code base, we have left some things running that we don't need running, or in some cases probably have cut things out that we did need. Uh, but understanding that better would definitely be useful for uh, you know identifying what that 13% of your CPU running is actually doing, and then going and seeing yeah, if we need yeah, it. Yeah, um, yeah. I think at some point we we should pro well we should probably create an issue to to. At some point, to do a profiling session uh, that would just, you know, give us a, a, a real view and precise view of, of where the CPU is consumed. Yeah, I will. Um, I don't have a notepad, but I will make a note of that and do that after uh, after this meeting. Because at least having an issue where we can, when people ask what kind of resource usage we have, we can say, well, you know, even if we don't know, this is where we're going to find out and, you know, contribute yeah. your contribute your own uh, uh, findings or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we're at the point in the project where we are, you know, trying to squeeze absolutely everything out of it. But, it, you know, if we can find low hanging fruit and say like, oh, this cuts out, you know, a huge branch of stuff we don't need, then by all means, yeah. we, should, we should go into yeah, it. Because you know, I, I think what could be interesting is not not doing really big optimization, but maybe spotting um, quite obvious things like uh, the fact that um, uh, cluster, um, you know, uh, API negotiation on clusters would be made too uh, too often, or maybe on some of the CRD management that had been. That has been, you know, added on on Cube, Cube as well. There might be some things that take too much resources. I mean, at having a, a, an idea of the area where where it occurs, I think will will help us, and possibly allow us fixing just obvious things. Yeah, and to to Eric's point, absolutely, reporting metrics yeah. will, sure. <laughs> you know, be an important part of this. And even like, you know, uh, uh, profiling is great, but it's a snapshot in time. And if you exactly yeah see yeah. metrics always going up uh, until it restarts, then well, you sure. have a leak, and like profiling wouldn't have necessarily caught that. So yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I was thinking of profiling just because for now it seems that it's too high for what it does. So it seems there mm -hmm. is something that is a bit you know abnormal to me. That's my feeling. But then uh, as soon as it's it's fixed, uh, of course, metrics would be important to 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 track this in the future. Yeah, I think uh, I also want to make sure we uh, uh, know not just where this is coming from, but like is KCP as a slimmed down Kubernetes API server the cause? Or like, is that where things are happening? Is it happening in the etcd level? Is it happening yeah, yeah. in the cluster controller? I, you know, the cluster controller can absolutely have a bug, a memory leak, and you know, all kinds of problems. Mm. Um, but that's not. That's an optional component on top of the minimal API server. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, which sort of leads us to the next, the next point about when we are, uh, when we talk about KCP, we very often talk about it as one big thing, when in reality it's it's many multiple things, um, and some of the um, 
and that's mostly been fine. Uh, but every once in a while, something comes up that causes problems, like uh, Joaquin when trying to do the KCP ingress stuff, um, because cluster CRD and syncer code and type negotiation and deployment splitter are all in the same repo as KCP, which all depends on this fork from Kubernetes 118. Um, there are types that that aren't accessible uh, without. I think he was. I think you were using the dynamic client, which is not something we should recommend or, or require. Um, I don't think this is an urgent must happen now. Like work can't proceed until we do this split. But I think we should think about how we want to do this split. I think the best answer, that the best out outcome that I have been able to come up with is that we split cluster CRD and controller, syncer type negotiation, and all the splitters, which will eventually become a generic uh, uh, everything splitter into a separate repo and have the KCP repo depend on that instead of having them in one uh, uh, module together. That way, when people want to write the ingress controller or the uh, you know Knative service controller or whatever, they can do that against the multi-cluster repo without taking a dependency, a transitive dependency on uh, our Kubernetes fork. Um, I don't, like I said, I don't think that needs to happen, you know, oh my God, right now. But um, if people think that is not the path forward, we should talk about it. Uh, but I think that's probably where we'll end up at some point in the future. Does that sound correct? Yeah, I would incorrect? say KCP is, a light, KCP is a light integration. Probably I could see it being a subset of pulling a couple of functionalities together. And the other repos would be the deeper. You're right on the cube one. Um, uh, it probably well, really should depend on a minimal API server, which again, like, depending on KK is the problem because the only right. way to get cube is to depend on KK today. You can't actually do anything useful with K API server that's cube like uh, or yeah. efficiently enough, you know. Well, I, I think we I think in the uh, in the fullness of time a lot of what is in KCP or everything that's in our fork goes away, goes upstream and some of the stuff that's in the KCP repo in this in this version of this KCP repo could go away and go upstream. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, eventually. Yeah, the controllers really aren't anything that should be that dependent on KCP. It's probably the other way around. Yeah, um, yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, so I think that's something, and we, we want to, I think we want to, I don't want to re reopen and relitigate the topic, but I think we still want to have the ability for one binary to run KCP, the cluster controller, and any number of splitters and sinkers um, for demo purposes, for like you know proving that that you can embed this all in one place. Uh, and if we want that, then KCP has to depend on multi-cluster. If we don't want that, if we don't think that's a, a hard requirement, then we could have all of them be separate atomized repos. And the way to glue them together is to check them check out the ones you need run those as separate things that feels just kind of gross like i don't want to have to i don't want the demo to be okay go fetch 15 repos and run separate 15 binaries that's not but fun. yeah because, on the other yeah. hand sorry i mean on the other hand that doesn't it relate to you know the um library aspect of it i mean if we think that if, if you think about how um all in one kcp is done for now it's mainly just uh, including some code in the um, you know postal hook, um, and so if, if if KCP was available um, as I mean KCP as a library, I'm speaking um, uh, as a library where was available you know uh, as a library and try point where you can add typically things like postal hook. I mean things that you want to to the various controllers and other you know active components that you want to hook into kcp into the kcp library then you know maybe you don't need um the the only repo that you finally need to have is, is a end-to-end -end demo repo because kcp would would be much more uh the the library glue that allows you building your own you know demo or your, your own all-in-one solution I, I think we have to to include our uh, 
our idea of, of KCP, the library, in, into that. You know, the, the, the sort of uh, library to, to build your own all-in-one command line. Yeah, I, I, and probably it, it's almost like another way of saying that, Dave, is like if um, as a, the library thing is only successful if you can accumulate a library, and that means that the KCP repo should be fairly small, pulling together yeah. a number of pieces that feel like they compose well. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe there's a difference. I think there's like minimal, it's, again, it's the same stuff we're talking about, like minimal API server is distinct from logical clusters, which is distinct from transparent multi-cluster. Transparent multi-cluster is not terribly useful or is not as useful independently as it would be with something like logical clusters, at least for now. And so maybe there's a subset down the road, which is like, yeah, you could go run all the logical cluster stuff and people will use that as library, but I tend to suspect that most of the most of the code we're talking about would live in a multi-cluster, like transparent multi-cluster enabling is its own big enough thing. And the transparent part is what makes it big, not the library bits of it. Like um, mm -hmm. you know, having some opinionation about services. And, and I think even another one is like, uh, community to make the use case really exciting. You want to give someone a reason to go run this and give someone a reason to contribute. There is a little bit of a big tent approach to transparent multi-cluster that I think benefits everybody that, you know, there'll absolutely be like use cases that are like, I don't want all these different things, but you know, it's like a reasonable thing that there might be a couple hundred different default policy little tweaks that it's just reasonable to accept into a repo that absolutely people who are using the library version of multi-cluster might not want. Or, um, mm -hmm. But I think KCP is like the, keeping the demo alive as a thing has a lot of value just in the setting a direction that gives a reason to have all these different libraries. Because if you just have a bunch of different libraries, you know, you're always going to run into that. Well, why are we doing all these different libraries? They're not related. They don't push each other to excel. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think what I'm hearing is that we are not in general disagreeing that there should be this separate multi-cluster repo, but now whether the KCP standalone KCP library repo is includes the end-to-end -end demo uh glue or whether that's a separate repo. I think we mm -hmm. all want the end-to-end -end demo to to live on and be existing forever. Yeah. Um, I'd say let's just leave it there for now. We can always like I don't think anything about the splitting out over time causes us to be able to not change that at some point in the future. Like yeah, until we yeah, succeed yeah. with the demos, I would say KCP, the repo exists to hit that success mark. And then we'll this, you know, as we'll we'll kind of like keep ourselves honest. Are we are we biting off more? Okay, maybe we should clone that yeah. out. Is it time that we've succeeded? Okay, we've succeeded. Now let's reorganize this and turn this into a real project, not just a prototype. Mm -hmm. Right. The 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 specific impetus for thinking about all of this in general was Joaquin wanted to add the KCP ingress stuff and hit a roadblock. And I, this is this is the time where I want to get all the roadblocks out of the way, right? I want people to be able to contribute, you know, the ingress splitter and the everything splitter without having any headaches. And so, yep. um, yeah, that's sort of the only urgency is doing it so that people can contribute stuff easily. If it wasn't for that, I don't think we would have this on the radar at all. We would do this sometime later but yeah because the main problem was was the incompatibility with client go because you you inherit from from kcp so you in, inherit from kubernetes 1.18 and so from client go 1.18 and then you are not able to use a client go that, that contains your own you know ingress v2 uh, typically uh, objects uh, so that, that's the yeah. main underlying problem that we 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 would try to solve by separating the repos or at least separating the Go modules. Will that uh, actually solve the problem, though? Uh, that's a question. Yeah, I don't actually. I don't have the answer. Yeah. So I, let's figure out what we have to do to solve that, and then we can bring yeah. it back. Yeah. Uh, I really don't want to have separate Go modules in the same repo. That's yeah. in every time Yay. I've ever tried that, I've regretted it. But it's yeah. Uh, yeah, not I, off I'm the not, table. Just. I, I'm not advocating uh, putting them in yeah. the same repo, just saying that it's mainly a question of, of you know, modules. And, and as a prototype, I'd say we're optimized for velocity versus we are about clean structure. So it's only when we're like, because having more repos is just a pain. So yeah, I, I, I totally agree. What I what I what what I meant was our lack of clean structure has 
has hurt mm -hmm. Joaquim's velocity in being able to do what he was trying to do. So it, I normally wouldn't yeah. care, right? It's, it, the code can be as gross as it needs to be to, to make it work. But if our organization is making it hard to contribute, like now it is an issue and we should do it. But so, um, I think yeah. I think he got around it. I think you got around it. Uh, if that's not the case, then we should keep working on it. Uh, and and Woodley, sorry. Sorry, it's, no, go, go on, sorry. Um, uh, I, I basically use the, the available ingress. I think it's the alpha one or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I had to deploy older Kubernetes, uh, local clusters, kind clusters, you know? So yeah, it's just that. I mean, I, I can play around with that, but um, having that claim go replacement in the go mod, honestly, just doesn't let me import other stuff or, or make it more clear. Uh, yeah. Isn't isn't the solution for, I mean, the, the short-term or mid-term solution for this to simply just update, uh, rebase the, the Kubernetes branch, the feature branch on the last uh, on Kubernetes master, I mean? Because that, that yeah. could help, yeah, for example. Because, because then in client go, we would have all the old um apis as v1 alpha you you can still you know include all apis if i'm not mistaken uh at least yeah, there has been a ton of change so appear. david if that's something you want to pick up that might be or see what that would look like um there's definitely gonna be a little bit of churn in there um you're gonna have to reconstruct some of the the patches because people probably have touched some of those core layer things. yeah 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 i remember i don't remember which one but i i know that i saw at least one part that where things had changed a bit, but yeah, I'm I'm not that uh, that worried. But yeah, probably or, in 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 one week or or so, I would be able to to start looking into this. Cool, cool, and that I mean uh, that would also help us prepare these changes as caps, right? Um, yeah, yeah, which is of course, a medium term, be, long term goal, but yeah, exactly. That would probably be the opportunity to, you know, also clean up a bit the the list of the of the commits that we have in the in the branch, at least to to match those that that you know were fixed uh, afterwards or stuff like that uh, yeah. a bit, and then prepare for for future contributions. I don't know. Nice. Um, okay. Uh, great. I don't really have any other pressing topics. Does anybody else have anything on their mind uh, that they want to go over in this forum? Uh, so I am working through some of the policy stuff. So um, looking at how you could use logical clusters to do hierarchy of policy. So you could have, because um, like, again, at the end of the day, like Qubit or Self-service of logical clusters is a unique thing that logical clusters give you that namespaces don't quite. Um, so there's a, I have a doc I'm kind of working on and working with some um, just examples that kind of work through like, what if you wanted to use logical clusters as the basis of a self-service system where you have some policy controls about who can self-service? Could logical clusters make that easy, right? Because we can have a, a root logical cluster that contains all your policy and then when someone tries to go create a logical cluster through whatever mechanism, you can force policy at that point, and then you can, in theory, change policy into the covers, right? Because instead of just saying like only what's in etcd matters, which is kind of how Cube does it, and change global config of Cube if you want to change policy, taking a different approach, which would be um, you know you have a mission, and then you have what APIs are exposed, and then you actually have um, underlayering of etcd objects that you can play around with. Um, you can compose APIs differently. Looking at some new ways of mixing and matching the cube primitives to make the idea of, um, you can make self-service of a full cluster um, pretty powerful. And you can say like, what are the use cases? So working through a doc on that, um, it's taken a little bit longer, mostly because I keep coming up with interesting things that I got to figure out how to frame it as, this is a good idea, this is a bad idea. Um, expect a PR doc of some form that'll kind of lay out. Here's an example of a bunch of different pieces and how you could use them. And then go back, we'll go back through and say like, okay, like I'll try to get a prototype of it for the demo, which might be the KCP demo comes in and you're like, I want to add a cluster. I want to add a logical cluster for this person. They can only see that logical cluster. 
here's how policy would actually act to, to add the security guarantees that we want to say, you know, two teams could use completely different APIs and actually be completely independent and how that might uh, propagate down and how you could use some of the flexibility of, of um, logical clusters to change stuff on demand. Like one morning you wake up and your, your APIs have been upgraded to a future version. How would we roll that out? Um, how would you do rate limiting? so that multiple teams could collaborate and one team can't blow out another. So stuff like that, um, nothing, the doc is still exploding versus uh, starting to get pruned out, so. <laughs> What's the, there was a, uh, I'm gonna butcher it, but it was like Mark Twain was like, sorry, I wrote such a long letter, I didn't have time to make I'm it right, any shorter. Right, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and, and I think that's the, there's a lot of good ideas. What are the ideas that would be most useful for someone who's thinking about a KCP-like thing as transparent multi-cluster plus self-service? Because one of the big things about transparent multi-cluster is letting you expose clusters that people can't actually directly access. And that kind of um, giving that decoupling from your underlying clusters is a unique thing that nobody really does as a standard cube-like tool today. So uh, I'll, I'll have right. some pieces in there that kind of focus on what the, the key uh, goals that fit in with our goals and our overall transparent multi-cluster objectives. Yeah, so so, so let's go, go ahead, David, go ahead. Sorry, uh, technical question. So would this imply typically cluster parents because you, know, you have yeah. this in what you initially defined? It would be examples of like, what would, what would a couple of concrete cluster parent examples look like that solve a particular self-service policy mm, problem okay. that would be useful for someone who wanted to run multiple cube apps across multiple clusters without exposing those clusters directly to end users? Mm. So, um, mm. you know, these are the basic rules. Here's the rules that apply to you. Maybe you don't get to add clusters. Um, Maybe uh, you know what are the what are all the implications of that? Um, how do you determine what the set of APIs that are exposed are? Yeah, but it, by the way, uh, just to 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 confirm this, um, in in a document you mentioned that um, it, even today uh, we on every logical cluster we include uh, the um, APIs. I mean the CRDs that are in the admin. So in the uh, implicit parent of uh, any logical cluster, that's not implemented today. I mean, that's still something that should be done and that's not really clear how um, the, the best way to do that. So, I mean, yeah, I, the, the idea of a logical cluster that has a set of predetermined APIs mm. and that can be defined, I think is a, will, will be something I'd call out because the set of APIs you have available determines what you can do and what would we need to protect? You know, what does it mean if somebody creates, if an admin wants everybody to have a um, deployment resource, but you want to create something that doesn't have a deployment resource, does that mean that you can't add a CRD mm. that says it's deployment? So some of that stuff is like teasing out use cases of, um, I want yeah. logical clusters to have different types of apps and strong yeah. controls. How does, that, how does that limit or what are the use cases that we would need to look at? So is uh, uh, it sounds like you're describing RBAC for logical clusters. Is there something more complex than just enforcing existing RBAC policies? Or oh, can yeah, you express yeah. them as RBAC policies? This just the, like... uh, I think it's kind of the combo of it's RBAC is interesting, but then there's a bunch of things like that RBAC doesn't approach at all, like um, the ability to create logical clusters allows you to consume logical clusters. What would we do for quota? Would we use resource quotas? Um, where do resource quotas fall down? Resource quotas aren't designed to be per person. If you wanted to do self-service and say, like every person at your company can use this much uh, resource by default, and then has to be granted a higher level, what would that look like? Would it be a combo of resource quota, RBAC, and a net new type of extension or policy? Um, what would that need to be we we never really um say multi-cluster or working group multi-cluster has done a ton of stuff around this thinking about it for namespaces um there's a lot of examples where the decision point was well we just have to layer something on top of namespaces or we add a webhook admission mm -hmm. looking at some of those use cases and being like if you the, the the analog is i can add a namespace to an existing cluster how do i control that 
if I want to add a logical cluster, what are all the types of policies that people are trying to solve for right now that they might be encoding an emission, they might be encoding elsewhere, but they don't quite line up with the actual use case. Um, so per person, per org, um, who you are, does who you are get to determine how much you can do, or is who you are and what you can do um, completely up to the end user? What's the most useful set of tools? Um, mm. Composability of self-service, I think, is really the heart of mm. self-service sucks in Cube. And I mean suck in the sense of you can build anything you want on top of it. Um, can we improve that with a half step and saying we've thought about some self-service up front for logical clusters, therefore logical clusters are actually more useful than namespaces for self-service, mm -hmm. which reduces the need for us to go layer a bunch of stuff on namespaces. Right, that makes sense. Uh, instead of beefing up namespaces, invent a new thing that is self-service by default, that is assumed from existence to be self-service, and uh, we can we have more control over its semantics, right? Right, and, and conversely, namespaces are very useful for layering your own things on top of. That's enabled people to go build these. Yeah. What would it need? What would it need to? What would you need to have to let you say, "Oh, but we'll turn this off," so that an admin with our back could be the one creating logical clusters, and you don't need any self-service mechanism. Um, so mm -hmm. I think both of those are are reasonable. And um, you're talking about the trade-offs. Is there a single design that we can learn from namespaces and what we've done around namespace tenancy that you could bake in? Yeah, as you said, Jason. Is there is there any prior art like like have people built a self service namespace? I mean, OpenShift yeah. started with. I mean, OpenShift launched with self service namespace. We use like virtual resources, mm -hmm. and the and then we a lot of people duplicated various different approaches. So I'd say like the the prior art is that most people the, the sum of all people using Kubernetes have tried most variations. And they all have trade-offs. Looking at those trade-offs, which are the common ones, um, you know, any organization using GitOps is effectively um, making those trade-offs at a higher level. Um, anyone using RBAC to control what namespaces you have access to is typically defining it at a higher level. Is that higher definition useful? Um, self-service is kind of one of those. Cube enables self-service, and then people build the controls to take that self-service away. Mm. Uh, is there anything we can learn from that that would be useful as a module alongside logical clusters? But yeah, there's a ton of prior yeah. art. Uh, yeah, I have I have previously wanted an RBAC rule for I can create things and update things I have created, but not update all the things. Right. Or you know, I want and to be able to. And that basically requires two other things, which is I can limit how many things someone asks for. Yeah. And I can limit the sum of the things inside what I asked for. And the flip side of it is also um, I can see all of the things I own, which you can impose on top of namespaces with labels, um, but you can't impose on top of namespaces with RBAC without building a layer to do detection of RBAC. Like OpenShift has that, um, you know, an informer cache that does RBAC resolution to say, show all of the namespaces you have access to. Mm. That's through a different resource we discussed at the time with namespaces imposing that in cube and then just decided, um, you know, let's just skip it and then we'll learn from what people do. This is kind of the, all right, it's five, six years later, let's go back and learn what people did. Um, take right. what the latest from working group multi-cluster and then um, make some proposals that might actually, we can't do it to namespaces without changing the semantics of namespaces. But maybe there's a coordination point for everybody to say, like, oh, logical clusters could be something we put in cube, could be something layered on top of cube. The combo of those could build these in. Could we build enough of a consensus for everybody who's trying to solve this that we'd all be like, yeah, yeah, this is what we want. Yeah. Hmm. And the um, self-service is distinct from create on demand, right? Uh, uh, Right now, you can create a new logical cluster just by requesting right. a separate context, right? Or, or inventing a new name for your logical cluster, and it 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 comes into existence when you ask for it. That's distinct from I can I can ask the system whether it's explicit or implicit. I can ask the system for a thing, and it gives it to me a a, a logical cluster, and it gives yeah. It Originally, namespaces were actually on demand. Um, there was a hmm. an controller that went and created them. It's actually, I think it's still buried in the code somewhere. It's just not on by default on the admission chain. 
Mm -hmm. um, but that's actually how Cube focused prior to 1.0. You could create namespaces when you use them. Um, I don't know that many people have actually asked for it, but there is an element of that, which is um, there are use cases where uh, if you have controls, be like the first 100 people to grab something, get it, and everybody else gets denied, um, that don't quite work that well. And most people still want an explicit create. So that yeah. one's a little bit less common, but it does come up. And uh, the only reason that KCP does it now is just expediency. Um, right, they're, right. They're putting out the two systems of, controlling logical clusters and where it goes from creation and operation. That's something in namespaces we did not do, but I think it's worth discussing with the policy stuff now. Yeah, and we might, I mean, I, I don't think there's a reason we need logical clusters to be created on demand forever. We might decide we want them to be explicitly created uh, for the for consistency with the rest of the resources in in the world, right? Like you need to ask for a namespace to be able to get one. And, um, and yeah. namespaces require that because we we designed with the impl implicit expect expectation that we would support aggregated API servers, and so mm -hmm. there's a controller that has to look at all of the resources in a namespace to go delete those because those might be located on other servers. We might actually say, you know what? Uh, logical clusters shouldn't support that, or KCP or a more opinionated version of logical clusters explicitly doesn't want to support that, which might mean then you don't need the equivalent of the namespace delete controller. Um, mm. And what are the lessons learned from aggregated APIs? A lot of people use aggregated APIs. There's a lot of serious problems with aggregated APIs using different etcd stores. The first one is like, it just doubles or triples your operational complexity for restore and backup. And you're adding a new single point of failure. Um, you're adding a new point of failure, which is you can only delete a namespace if all aggregated APIs respond. What are some lessons learned from that? Do we actually need to solve that? Um, that that fits into the model around what does a logical cluster mean? And mm -hmm. we'll probably have to pick something uh, to make logical clusters useful. Well, to pick a, a direction to go there. Because for, for now, logical clusters are just nothing. They are just a, a scope in, in, in what you get from a TCD. Right. So, uh, so then, then you're not doing deletion of logical clusters today. There's actually no way. Yeah. Because you have to keep track of which resources were created ever in that, even if the resources change, so that you can clean them up. So then the next time mm -hmm. someone creates a logical cluster with the same name, you don't get duplication. So that that transactional guarantee is either imposed above cube with something like the namespace, like that's imposed above cube in the namespace controller and with mm -hmm. the attributes on namespace, okay. or it can be imposed underneath with transactional clears and all that in etcd. We just have to make a decision one way or the other, or mm -hmm. come up with a way where the, a system that solves those policy problems could probably make different decisions than cube and get away with it. We knew we were going to do aggregated APIs. Aggregated APIs with resources off the current etcd system, useful but not critical. Um, and there might be an argument for if you're running stuff off of your core system, your controller is actually responsible for that through UIDs and and um, and all that, not uh, not Cube itself or not the KCP control plane. There's a whole bunch of like, it's funny because like we just went through like uh, probably like almost like two or three years of like long debates from the first days of Cube, like in just like five minutes. So it's like, uh, do we really need to rehash all that? That's partially what the doc is um, going to try to frame some of the previous trade offs and which ones would we explore because um, they have real concrete use cases backing them. Yeah, I mean, that, that's it. That's why it's absolutely helpful to have somebody with this historical context helping with this because otherwise we would spend two years having that same argument again instead of just saying like hey i've read this book i know how it ends or i've read this book and i wish it ended differently uh we should do the other way instead Let, let's fail differently this time yeah 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 <laughs> let's just all fail differently that's really what we're going for um uh great that is that is uh very interesting and i look forward to reading that uh Anything else on anybody's mind uh, before, I guess we have 12 more minutes? Mm. What's up? 
Uh, I'm just really glad I joined this meeting because uh, it's probably the best meeting I've been on in a few weeks. Um, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've been playing around with uh, working with multi clusters uh, with this tool Scribe that um, copies um, persistent volume from cluster to cluster. And I've often wondered if what I did was sort of the best way. So I'm really looking forward to looking at the code and to see how how you um, interact with multi clusters. Like, um, I think I created a different client with, you, you said each cluster has a kube config. Basically, it's just like an object with a kube config. And so you just create like a different context for each cluster. And and is that the way that you interact with multiple clusters? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm interested to look into it to see if what I did kind of matches what you did to see if, if what I did was a good idea. Yeah, so, so the main, uh... Every cluster object that is basically registered with the KCP has basically just a kube config in it. Um, but what we do with that is when we when we get that kube config, we uh, install a sinker on the cluster, either in the cluster or outside of the cluster, either way. But we basically say, this kube config gives you the information you need to talk to that cluster. And also, here's the information to talk back to KCP. And then this sinker job uh, lists objects of all types labeled for that cluster and copies them to the API server and then copies the status back. So there isn't a direct synchronous request from KCP or the cluster controller for every object. There's really only one synchronous request to say, go install the sinker there. And then the sinker does this like asynchronous copy back and forth. There's also like health checks on the sinker. Um, but that way, the if the cluster goes uh, goes disconnected for some amount of time and we're not like completely lost in the dark, there's there's a sinker that will, when it comes back up, it will check and and pull the rest down and sync all the rest of the statuses up. Um, does that answer your question? That so it's not like a, a direct a, a direct synchronous request except to install the sinker that does the async stuff from that. Yeah, yeah. I'm just super looking forward to looking at it and see what you did. Is that how Scribe works? I, uh, uh, well, I'm not familiar with Scribe. Um, no, Scribe, I, I just um, built a CLI for Scribe. And that's, that's oh. I, I kind of just I took whatever qconfigs you, you gave and then um, created a, um, a client based on those contexts. Is that okay. yeah, so. Um, so yeah, like, I definitely take this PV from this cluster and copy the stuff from it and put it in cluster two. Yeah. 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 I think that's going to be uh, something like that is going to be very necessary for this to work. I mean, we've we've got deployments, uh, you know, like run this workload over there. Uh, Joaquin's working on networking. Uh, the next thing is like you know persistent data and how that moves and follows. Uh, you know. Uh, as clusters come and go. I think mm -hmm. a difficulty will be if that cluster goes away, like is completely deleted, then we don't have, uh, we need to have already copied some of that data or hopefully all of that data. Uh, otherwise we've lost our chance to like go get it. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't know exactly, I, I, I don't think I have thought at all about uh, persistent volumes, um, but I'm excited that someone is and uh, <laughs> Yeah. Cool. Uh, uh, let me know if you have any trouble, and we'll we'll help. All right. Figure that out. And then my other question, or was, uh, is there an easy way to look at the commits um, from your Kubernetes fork? But then I I saw the um, the comment there. It's like hack feature workaround. I could look for those commits. I'm just you know curious to see what what you had to do to. Kubernetes to make this work. And then I was curious why why 118 as opposed just because that's when you started working on this? Uh, more or less. I mean, I think that actually predates me. So um, uh, me as a red hatter, not as a human. Um, if uh, I think it would be useful because I think people have asked that too, like what what is the diff between what we are doing and even 118? Uh, I think it would be useful to have somewhere a handy link for like on GitHub, the diff between those two things. It's not uh, It's not going to be so much of a diff that the UI falls over. Uh, at least I don't think so. So it, so it should be something we can easily link to. 
But um, as this evolves, yeah. the goal is to not like fork Kubernetes. It's to no, sort of see no. what you need from it and then have it. Yeah. And then, right. and, yeah. and, and then my yeah. other question is, if that's the case, then how is it? Um, how are you going to make sure it's always going to be in sync? Like, is there in the future going to be like a spec, a Kubernetes spec that, like, you know, any Kubernetes has to adhere to, like, so that you know that. So I mean, like, that's kind of already covered. Uh, probably by saying there's a set of conformance tests that you'd run and. Yeah, yeah. Probably with this, we'd say, um, I think that definition is not there yet, but the but like the key goal is 95% of applications work on modified, which is close enough to saying like conformance should pass. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's not in conformance that would be absolutely critical for a client. Um, so that's more of a goal, a gap. But Kubernetes conformance isn't really, it's just one small thing that protects the trademark that has a fairly noble, but possibly slightly overly unrealistic goal of defining that someone can run the same app on different cube clusters. It's not really doing that. Um, it's a set of, you know, it's trying to test that the, the APIs behave the way you'd expect. The spec that we would probably say is that the API definition objects behave in a consistent way. But I also don't know that that would be necessarily, like it would need to be consistent enough for the applications to work. But the goal necessary might not be um, the goal is probably going to be something that looks more like a KCP specific conformance definition. That there also is an overlap with uh, people who want to build minimal API servers. But I don't because APIs are actually the bit. It's how the APIs work and then what APIs as two different things. Mm -hmm. The goal here is that how they work and what API are going to be separate. And you might actually mix and match. You know, I want this version of CRDs, you know, 1.0. Mm -hmm. But the moment we add a field to a CRD in 1.24, that has to be an optional field for V1. And therefore, if you don't support it, does that mean you're not conform it? No, it just means you have to take that into account. What do clients have to do? Most cube clients, once it's a V1 API, we just say, the API's got to keep working. So I, I think, Sally, we're probably a little too early to answer all the implications there. But yes, a, a cube client working against a cluster today should work against this. And then the more that we evolve the spec for what does it mean to, to be a cube compatible API, mm -hmm. might still belong to cube, but it might be you know part of that conformance program there, or it might be outside of cube. Um, just because there's other projects that have this problem that want to use minimal API servers, but change the rules somewhat. Yeah. Um, David, did you did you have some? I, I feel like I remember you say, having something to say, but I don't know if that was a while ago. Well, just about the question of of uh, mainly what are the changes in the Kubernetes um, mm -hmm. branch? Uh, it's it's mainly. Uh, three points or two, uh, mainly enabling customer source definitions to define objects that initially uh, in cube were, you know, um, internal objects, let's say deployments, apps, stuff like that, uh, because we want this to be a minimal API server. Uh, that's the first thing. The second one is mainly adding um, tenancy, so logical clusters um, inside uh, Kubernetes. Which mainly means that, you know, I mean, the current implementation is that from a, a sub K uh, in ATCD storage, we infer the cluster in which uh, the data is set, in fact. And the whole point of a number of changes is, is to uh, ensure that we correctly set and get this cluster name. Cluster name already exists uh, in, in cube objects, but it's just uh, empty. Uh, so we use that. So that's the second change. And the, the third one, and I don't give them in, in chronological order, sorry. But the third one is, is mainly for uh, custom resources to support the, the tenancy. That means that um, because when you add a custom resource, then you have to you know build the overall uh, open API schema and also the discovery information that you get from, from Cube when you point to slash APIs. And so we have to build this in a way that is tenant compatible. That means that if you point to a given logical cluster context, you will give 
uh, all the open API schemas and also discovery from all the CRDs that were added in this logical cluster. And if you point to the context of a distant logical cluster, that then you would get a, a distinct set of APIs and open API schemas. So that's mainly the three changes um, uh, that were, you know, uh, that comprise the, the various hacks that you can find in the Kuban, Kubernetes switcher branch. Yeah, I think, it, I think it would be useful to uh, write those down and with like distinct, you know, diffs, yeah, yeah, commits yeah. that say, you know, like diff ranges that say like this, uh, this is where we were doing this stuff. This is where we were doing this stuff. Um, yeah, that, will be, yeah. that will pay off later when we've contributed upstream. We can say this chunk of stuff yeah. is this work we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, we did that with, um, with yeah. Docker when, when uh, we were, we had our fork of Docker, and then it became Podman. But we had a list, like a, it was a, a blog, I think, a list of all of the patches that we had and why we had them. And yeah, it was. Yeah, unfortunately, there was a pending document uh, whose goal was to be added in the in the repo, but was not done for now. So it's still uh, in the on the to-do list to document the, the, those changes. Since we also plan to. Um, uh, rebase that uh, those changes on the last Kubernetes uh, release. That would probably uh, a chance be a chance to first um, a bit clean up the the commit history, mm -hmm. and then uh, e more easily document that uh, in the KCP uh, repository. Yeah. Great. Uh, sounds good, everyone. We are basically out of time and. A lot we went over today. So check the notes when they get posted later today. Uh, and we'll see you later. Have a good week, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Hey. Stop reading. Stop the recording. <laughs>